Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, Chapter 29, in which certain incidents are narrated which are only to be met with on American railroads. The train pursued its course that evening without interruption, passing Fort Saunders, crossing Shane Pass and reaching Evans Pass. The road here attained the highest elevation of the journey, 8,092 feet above the level of the sea. The travelers had now only to descend to the Atlantic by limitless plains leveled by nature. A branch of the Grand Trunk led off southward to Denver, the capital of Colorado. The country round about is rich in gold and silver, and more than 50,000 inhabitants are already settled there. 1,382 miles had been passed over from San Francisco in three days and three nights, Four days and nights more would probably bring them to New York. Phileas Fogg was not as yet behind hand. During the night, Camp Walbuck was passed on the left. Lodgepole Creek ran parallel with the road, marking the boundary between the territories of Wyoming and Colorado. They entered Nebraska at 11, passed near Sedgwick and touched at Julesburg on the southern branch of the Platte River. It was here that the Union Pacific Railroad was inaugurated on the 23rd of October 1867 by the chief engineer General Dodge. Two powerful locomotives carrying nine cars of invited guests, among whom was Thomas C. Durant, vice president of the road, stopped at this point. Cheers were given. The Sioux and Pawnees performed an imitation Indian battle. Fireworks were let off, and the first number of the Railway Pioneer was printed by a press brought on the train. Thus was celebrated the inauguration of this great railroad, a mighty instrument of progress and civilization, thrown across the desert and destined to link together cities and towns which do not yet exist. The whistle of the locomotive, more powerful than Amphion's lyre, was about to bid them rise from American soil. Four Macpherson was left behind at eight in the morning and 357 miles had yet to be traversed before reaching Omaha. The road followed the capricious windings of the southern branch of the Platte River on its left bank. On, at nine, the train stopped at the important town of North Platte, built between the two arms of the river, which rejoin each other around it and form a single artery, a large tributary whose waters empty into the Missouri a little above Omaha. The 101st meridian was passed. Mr. Fogg and his partners had resumed their game no one, not even the dummy, complained of the length of the trip. Fix had begun by winning several guineas, which he seemed likely to lose, but he showed himself a not less eager whist player than Mr. Fogg. During the morning, chance distinctly favoured that gentleman. Trumps and honours were showered upon his hands. Once, having resolved a bold stroke, he was on the point of playing a spade when a voice behind him said, I should play a diamond. Mr. Fogg, Aouda and Fix raised their heads and beheld Colonel Proctor. Stamp Proctor and Phileas Fogg recognized each other at once. Ah, it's you, is it, Englishman? cried the colonel. It's you who are going to play a spade. And who plays it? replied Phileas for coolly throwing down the ten of spades. Well, it pleases me to have a diamonds, replied Colonel Proctor in an insolent tone. 
He made a movement as if to seize the card which had just been played, adding, You don't understand anything about West. Perhaps I do as well as another, said Phileas Fogg, rising. You have only so to try, son of John Bull, replied the colonel. Aouda turned pale, and her blood ran cold. She seized Mr. Fogg's arm and gently pulled him back. Pass part two was ready to pounce upon the American who was staring insolently at his opponent. But Fix got up, and going to Colonel Proctor said, You forgot that it is I with whom you have to deal, sir, for it was I whom you not only insulted but struck. Mr. Fix, said Mr. Fogg, pardon me, but this affair is mine and mine only. The colonel has again insulted me by insisting that I should not play a spade, and he shall give me satisfaction for it. When and where you will, replied the American, and with whatever weapon you choose. Aouda in vain attempted to retain Mr. Fogg, as vainly did the detective endeavor to make the quarrel his. Passepart too wished to throw the colonel out of the window, but a sign from his master checked him. Phileas Fogg left the car, and the American followed him upon the platform. Sir, said Mr. Fogg to his adversary. I am in a great hurry to get back to Europe, and any delay, whatever, will be greatly to my disadvantage. Well, what's that to me? replied Colonel Proctor. Sir, said Mr. Fogg very politely, after our meeting at San Francisco, I determined to return to America and find you as soon as I had completed the business which called me to England. Really? Will you appoint a meeting for six months hence? Why not ten years hence? I say six months, returned Phileas Fogg, and I shall be at the place of meeting promptly. Oh, this is an evasion, cried Stamp Proctor. Now or never. Very good. You are going to New York? No. To Chicago? No. To Omaha? What difference is it to you? Do you know Plum Creek? No, replied Mr. Fogg. It's the next station. The train will be there in an hour. And we'll stop there. Ten minutes. In ten minutes, several revolver shots could be exchanged. Very well, said Mr. Fogg. I will stop at Plum Creek. And I guess you'll stay there, too, added the American insolently. Who knows? replied Mr. Fogg, returning to the car as coolly as usual. He began to reassure Aouda, telling her that blusterers were never to be feared and begged Fix to be his second at the approaching duel, a request which the detective could not refuse. Mr. Fogg resumed the interrupted game with perfect calmness. At eleven o'clock, the locomotive's whistle announced that they were approaching Plum Creek Station. Mr. Fogg rose and, followed by Fix, went out upon the platform. Passepartout accompanied him, carrying a pair of revolvers. Aouda remained in the car, as pale as death. The door of the next car opened and Colonel Proctor appeared on the platform, attended by a Yankee of his own stamp and his second. But just as the combatants were about to step from the train, the conductor hurried up and shouted, You can't get off, gentlemen! Why not? asked the colonel. We are twenty minutes late and we shall not stop. But I'm going to fight a duel with us, gentlemen. I'm sorry, said the conductor, but we shall be off at once. There's the bell ringing now. The train started. I am really very sorry, gentlemen, said the conductor. Under any other circumstances, I should have been happy to oblige you, but after all, as you have not had time to fight here, why not fight as we go along? That wouldn't be convenient, perhaps, for this gentleman, said the colonel in a jeering tone. It would be perfectly so, replied Phileas Fogg. Well, we are really in America, thought Passepartout, and the conductor is a gentleman of the first order. So muttering, he followed his master. 
The two combatants, their seconds and the conductor, passed through the cars to the rear of the train. The last car was only occupied by a dozen passengers whom the conductor politely asked if they would not be so kind as to leave it vacant for a few moments as two gentlemen had an affair of honour to settle. The passengers granted the request with alacrity and straightway disappeared on the platform. The car, which was some fifty feet long, was very convenient for their purpose. The adversaries might march on each other in the aisle and fire at their ease. Never was duel more easily arranged. Mr. Fogg and Colonel Proctor, each provided with two six-barreled revolvers, entered the car. The seconds, remaining outside, shot them in. They were to begin firing at the first whistle of the locomotive. After an interval of two minutes, what remained of the two gentlemen would be taken from the car. Nothing could be more simple. Indeed, it was all so simple that Fix and Passepartout felt their hearts beating as if they would crack. They were listening for the whistle agreed upon, when suddenly savage cries resounded in the air accompanied by reports which certainly did not issue from the car where the duelists were. The reports continued in front and the whole length of the train. Cries of terror proceeded from the interior of the cars. Colonel Proctor and Mr. Fogg, revolvers in hand, hastily quitted their prison and rushed forward where the noise was most clamorous. They then perceived that the train was attacked by a band of Sioux. This was not the first attempt of these daring Indians, for more than once they had waylaid trains on the road. A hundred of them had, according to their habit, jumped upon the steps without stopping the train with the ease of a clown mounting a horse at full gallop. The Sioux were armed with guns from which came the reports, to which the passengers, who were almost all armed, responded by revolver shots. The Indians had first mounted the engine and half stunned the engineer and stoker with blows from their muskets. A Sioux chief, wishing to stop the train but not knowing how to work the regulator, had opened wide instead of closing the steam value and the locomotive was plunging forward with terrific velocity. The Sioux had at the same time invaded the cars, skipping like enraged monkeys over the roofs, thrusting open the doors and fighting hand to hand with the passengers. Penetrating the baggage car, they pillaged it, throwing the trunks out of the train. The cries and shots were constant. The travelers defended themselves bravely. Some of the cars were barricaded and sustained a siege, like moving force carried along at a speed of a hundred miles an hour. Auda behaved courageously from the first. She defended herself like a true heroine with a revolver which she shot through the broken windows whenever a savage made his appearance. Twenty Sioux had fallen mortally wounded to the ground and the wheels crushed those who fell upon the rails as if they had been worms. Several passengers, shot or stunned, lay on the seats. It was necessary to put an end to the struggle which had lasted for ten minutes and which would result in the triumph of the Sioux if the train was not stopped. For Kearney Station where there was a garrison was only two miles distant, but that once passed, the Sioux would be mastered of the train between Fort Kearney and the station beyond. The conductor was fighting beside Mr. Fogg when he was shot and fell. At the same moment he cried, Unless the train is stopped in five minutes, we're lost. It shall be stopped, said Phileas Fogg, preparing to rush from the car. Stay, monsieur, cried Passepartout. I will go. 
Mr. Fogg had not time to stop the brave follow fellow who, opening a door unperceived by the Indians, succeeded in slipping under the car, and while the struggle continued and the balls whizzed across each other over his head, he made use of his old acrobatic experience and with amazing agility worked his way under the cars, holding on to the chains, aiding himself by the breaks and edges of the sashes creeping from one car to another with marvelous skill and thus gaining the forward end of the train. There, suspended by one hand between the baggage car and the tender, with the other he loosened the safety chains, but owing to the traction he would never have succeeded in unscrewing the yoking bar had not a violent concussion jolted this bar out. The train, now detached from the engine, remained a little behind, whilst the locomotive rushed forward with increased speed. Carried on by the force already acquired, the train still moved for several minutes, but the brakes were worked, and at last they stopped less than a hundred feet from Kearney Station. The soldiers on the fore, attracted by the shots, hurried up. The Sioux had not expected them and decamped in a body before the train entirely stopped. But when the passengers counted each other on the station platform, several were found missing. Among others, the courageous Frenchman, whose devotion had just saved them. So that was chapter 29. Bye-bye till next time with chapter 30 in which Phileas Fogg simply does his duty. <laughs>